Is Android about to kill sideloading? I think one of the most fundamental aspects of Android has always been the open nature that you can tinker with it, you can tweak it, you can do whatever you want with it because it's your phone. Is that actually being threatened? We had this post on the 25th of August, a new layer of security for certified Android devices, and they went over a really, really big change that's going to be coming to Android developer verification. The short version of this is that sometime relatively soon, not this year, probably not for most of next year, but eventually... Apps that are being installed on your phone will need to be verified. The developer of that app will need to be verified. If they're not verified, that app is not getting installed. Now, this is a very nuanced and complicated issue. And because of that, Google actually posted a 45-minute long video talking about this subject, going over many details. So what I've done is I have watched this video and I've pulled out little things and sort of answers to these questions as much as I can. And I'm going to try to present those to you and show you relevant clips in this video, just like a shortened version. So you don't have to watch a 45 minute long conversation. So first off, like the first thing that they talk about, they double down on the idea that this is about security, preventing scams and preventing malware. They actually give an analogy that is apt if indeed they are being totally honest. And it's up to you to determine if you think that they are or not. But they talk about the airline industry. At one point, there was just not a lot of security. You could just go get on the plane. Now there's a ton of security. Bad things happened. And that became necessary. And they're basically saying... That's kind of where we are. So let's say I'm developing an application and I want to distribute that application. What do I need to do? I need to basically sign up and verify myself with Google. There is a $25 fee to do that and they need my government ID to say, this is Shane Craig, these are Shane Craig's apps. And the reason for this is, is that if my apps are found to be malware, they can say, well, Shane Craig and Shane Craig's apps, you are delisted. These apps are no longer installable and you don't get to make apps that are distributed anymore. Now, why do they need a government ID? They say because it creates a hurdle for bad actors. It's kind of difficult if you are a bad actor and you get your verified ID banned to get another ID. That's what you're saying is that here there's more of a burden to to have a person. You can't easily duplicate yourself with it with a new government ID. And therefore, you know, it's 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 trickier. You could maybe get your cousin to publish or whatever, but you're going to run out of cousins, right? Is that is that exactly? And and on Android, there isn't even the concept of a person. There's just apps. So you just release more and more and more apps, and there is nothing tying these apps together. One interesting thing that they point to here is that the reason they're doing this is because they've already done something similar in the Play Store, and apparently that has been successful. If you're going to have an app distributed in the Play Store, they've already verified you in a similar manner. Speaking of the Play Store, so we you, you mentioned earlier that we had done this already and we had good results. Can you share more about what those good results were? Like, you know, or what data did we see that concluded that, well, this is actually the way to go? I don't remember the numbers off of my off the top of my head, but we've seen a double-digit reduction in bad actor activity um, on the Play Store. Uh, it just became too difficult for them the way that a lot of the bad actors um, operate uh, in these type of marketplaces is they create a lot of accounts. And by a lot, I mean um, huge numbers, thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands. Um, so when you think about a legitimate developer that says, hey, $25, that's a, a big fee and I need to give my ID and that's difficult. Um, now imagine somebody having to do that tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of times. It becomes really, really difficult. And even if you do it, um, it's very difficult to do it in a way that is um, unnoticeable. So you do it and all these issues start showing up and that's really um, turning our attention to these accounts and then we um, we can take care of them. And those bad actors don't monetize, they don't earn money. Um, it's more difficult for them to sustain these operations. Um, that's been going on on Play for a while um, and we're very happy with, with how it's working. 
So they're basically taking that policy from the Play Store and expanding it to all applications, even those distributed in other ways, either on someone's personal website or in other app stores in a shady link you found on Telegram or Facebook, whatever it might be, it's going to apply to all of those applications. So you go to install it and there's going to be a system on your phone, a verifier app that's going to check that APK. And if it cannot determine that that APK has attached to it a verified developer, it's just not going to install it. Now, something that I do find interesting is that in a couple of places, they do imply that you're still going to be able to sideload unverified applications using ADB, perhaps, or using Android Studio. I've been dabbling with a couple of app ideas of my own, and the way that I send updated versions of you know bug fixes I've made to my phone is I plug it in and I send it over that USB cable, and apparently I'm going to be able to continue doing that without being verified. Does this affect apps that aren't published? Like if I'm an Android developer and I just want to create a sample app, do I have to verify that sample app? If you're going to install it on your own device using ADB, for example. Yeah, or Android Studio, um, which uses ADB, but yep. yes. Then you're not going to need to verify. Okay. Um, if you want other people to use it, um, then you'll need to verify because now other entities are involved. We want to keep those people safe. Yeah. Or get them to install Android Studio. Right. That's, that's me trying to get more users. Yeah. Another thing I would, uh, we hear quite a bit of anxiety is that, hey, I'm a student and I'm just getting started and I'm building my apps. Um, I think so. ADB absolutely solves that problem from that perspective. But we have also talked about that, hey, we would allow if there is a limited scope of distribution, you have, um, we'll, we'll create an, and we'll announce it very soon. We are trying to gather feedback from from the developers who are early in the stage and they're, they don't want to have a mass distribution for that they don't need to go through all these hopes of ID verification and stuff. Personally, I kind of think that if I'm understanding them correctly and I can just sideload the application over ADB, even if it's an unverified APK, I kind of feel like this whole thing might be a little bit overblown because most people who are doing this, who are going to be trying to sideload unverified APKs, you probably know how to use ADB and, and do the command to just install it anyways. And that kind of leads me to another question people have had. What if you are a student or a hobbyist? You're not distributing your app to millions of people, just to small groups of people. Maybe you're in very early testing of things like what I've been doing. Do I need to give Google $25 and my government-issued identification? Apparently not. They're going to have a version of verification for these people, which will be free, and it'll also just use your email address. So they're not really going to go too crazy with those people. And how that's going to work is they're going to track how many unique devices your app has been installed on. And you're going to have a, a hard limit or something like that to prevent you from using this hobbyist version and still distributing your malware to potentially millions of people. Talking a little bit more about how that Verifier app works, it's something that's going to be built in to Android. Apparently it's there with what they're calling Android 16.1. He also said beta 2, so maybe that's what QPR2 is going to be called kind of as Android 16.1. I'm not exactly clear there, but it's going to be built into Android 16.1 and forward, and they're going to make it backwards compatible with older versions of Android by building in similar functionality into the Google Play Protect application. They also talk briefly about how this works in terms of connectivity. So you're installing this application, and it has to check your application and see if there's a registered developer attached to it. Well, it's going to need a network connection in order to find out if that's the case or not. But apparently there's also going to be a cached list of some of the most popular applications that will be stored locally on your device. And that will prevent you from needing a data connection. They also talk about some other things that they're doing that are a little bit complicated, complicated enough that I'm just going to play the clip from the video. So my phone has to be connected in order to install an APK. In the worst of cases, yes. Uh, How, okay, what is the best case? So in the best case, you hit a uh, cache. Okay. Um, so this trusted entity, the, de the developer verifier, can build all sorts of things on top of that kind of basic uh, back and forth. They're building a cache of uh, to be determined what will be contained in it, but 
presumably popular apps. Um, there's also a uh, pre-auth, we call it a pre-auth token. Um, it's basically a cryptographically verifiable blob that is associated with the package that's being installed that the, the installer can pass in uh, alongside the app and verify its uh, uh, the developer without having to hit uh, back end. Okay. So if you're installing something from a store, uh, as long as they can get the bytes for the APK, they can presumably also get the bytes for the pre-auth token and avoid any additional network back and forth. Now, look, the thing that I think makes people the most nervous and apprehensive about this is the concern that maybe Google isn't actually as concerned with security, malware, and scams. Maybe they are trying to just control what kinds of apps get to be installed on your phone, not just get to be in the Play Store, but get to be installed on your phone, period. The idea here would be, let's say I'm a developer and I make an application that breaks the terms of service for Android or that breaks the law or something like that. Well, maybe I don't want to put my name on that application for fear that I'm going to get in trouble with the government or something like that. That is absolutely a concern. But when they talk about moderation, they talk about what kinds of apps will get the developer in trouble, they do hone in on this being specifically about malware. Would this have sort of all the policies? I mean, we have some policies in the Play Store like, hey, you must have a privacy policy and so on. Is that the kind of thing that, hey, no privacy policy, therefore, no, therefore your apps are banned? No, actually, so there are no other policies other than the 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 high degree of harm, like this malware. Is clearly, malware. Yes. Here. So today, as you know, um, we already have those policies on certified devices where you cannot distribute malware, and then we have Google Play Protect that removes that app okay. from user same devices. Bar. So it's the same bar, and what we're gonna now add to that to say that, hey, we were already doing this today in on, in on certified devices. Now, additionally, if we know that that actor who was associated with that, that app, most likely other apps might have harm as well. So we're going to also restrict installation of that. So it immediately brings that level of protection to the user. I think that we're in a situation where even if Google were 100% just focused on preventing scams and malware and things like that, even if they were 100% focused on that, there's no ulterior motives, they are still going to catch other applications in the crossfire of this. I hear about YouTube revanced all the time. People install it so that they don't have to view ads whenever they're watching YouTube. It also adds lots of other quality of life features. So it's not just about ad blocking, but for a lot of people, it's primarily about blocking ads on their phones. How does that work? Well, you've got a patcher application. You get the YouTube APK, you run it through the patcher, it spits it back out and you install it. It's a modified version of YouTube. Is that modified version of YouTube going to be installable while this sort of thing is going on? Is it going to maintain some sort of signature that it had going in that it still has coming out? I don't know. I'm kind of skeptical that it's going to. So that might kill the whole revanced patcher scene, which there's a lot of patch steps. It might kill that entire scene, even if Google is explicitly stating here, we don't care about that. As long as it's not harming people, it's not scamming them, it's not malware, we don't care. It's going to impact that anyways. And then, of course, there are lots of other applications that are varying degrees of perhaps illegal piracy applications, for one thing, but then like kind of gray area applications like emulators for legal reasons. Developers probably don't necessarily want to have their government ID attached to those sorts of applications. So you can kiss those goodbye as well. Again, even if Google is being honest here, which it's up to you to figure out if they are or not for yourself, even if they're being honest and they're saying we don't care about these sorts of things, they're going to get caught up in this net anyways. I think that the t the toughest sort of feedback we've heard is, hey, anonymity is going away. Um, and and I understand that there there is something very fundamental about being able to distribute apps anonymously. Um, the, the tension is obvious, right? Um, anonymity is good for people who need it for good purposes, um, but it's also very, very convenient for bad actors. Um, and we think we reached a point where that trade-off is causing much more harm than good. 
um, which is why we need to sort of change the balance a little bit. I don't remember who said it, but there's a quote from someone that was something like the road to hell is paved with good intentions or something like that. And this could definitely be one of those situations. I mean, you may also just be hearing this and just completely not believing a word of it. You might be like, they don't care about scams and malware at all. Their concern, their their main priority is controlling who can install or what apps can be installed. Their concern is blocking patched apps and piracy apps and things like that. And you may be right. I don't know what kind of evidence you have one way or the other. All we can really do is listen to what they're saying and make our own judgments. But again, like I keep saying, even if their intentions are good, this might I don't know. This might not be the right approach. I mean, you, you mentioned that there was there was a, some complaint that, hey, you can't be anonymous anymore. What are the legitimate use cases to be anonymous? Is it like apps for dissidents and things like that? Is that? Yeah, that's an that's an example. It's a good question. It's not clear um, when anonymity is absolutely required. And it's not like Google is going to share that information um, with um, with the public or anything like that. But a lot of people just value their privacy and they want their anonymity. I think that's the main driver, right? Pe people just want to do things anonymously. Yeah, no, I again, the, the, that comes with a lot of risk for users. So I guess this is why we're doing it. Look, I don't think you can question the truth of the fact that allowing apps to be installed that come from anonymous developers does pose a risk to the end user. It absolutely does. But there's always a balance to be found when it comes to things like this. You're balancing how much you want to protect your users versus how much freedom they deserve to have. And to me, I think that if you're going to install an application, maybe this is how it should work. You still have a verification registration thing, but if your app is not verified and you try, someone tries to install it, rather than blocking it, it just pops up and says... This app was made by someone who is anonymous. We do not know who made this. This could be malware. This could be unsafe for you. If you want to then click install and they hack your bank account and steal all your money, that's just on you. That's just your fault and you deserve that. And maybe that's the better approach. For me, my hope is that they just sort of reconsider these things or that they at least leave the door open for users to just use ADB. If you're sideloading an application, is it really that big of a deal to just go to your computer, download the APK file, plug your computer in and do, what is it, ADB install and then the file path or whatever, it's whatever the command is. It's not difficult at all. You can find it on the internet very, very easily. Leave the door cracked for that sort of thing. And then what you've done is you've basically left sideloading of unverified apps only to people who are like the techiest of techie people, the people who will go and download AB, ADB and go through that process. And if they want to run that risk, that's a that is a percent of a percent, a subset of a subset of people. And I, I think that's probably fine. So leave that door open, Google. Don't close it completely. And I mean, look, if you look at the reaction to this video, it doesn't have a ton of views at all, but I've, I've brought back the dislike button to show you. 3.1 thousand views, 69 likes, 395 dislikes. Most people are not happy about this at all, or at least most people who watch this video. I do think that it is worth pointing out that most people will never notice this change at all. OK, it's just not something that the average user is ever going to be aware of. So this does kind of remind me of conversations around Samsung removing the S Pen from the Z Fold. There was an extremely vocal group of people who were like, this is a disaster. This is going to be terrible. No one's going to buy this phone. And then it turned out most people didn't care and the phone sold better than it did last year. So I think there is a little bit of that component going on as well. Sometimes those of us in the tech world, the tech community, sometimes we don't realize that what we care about and what we think is important isn't necessarily what most people care about and what most people think is important. But I do think in this instance, this is something that is important, not just because of the effects it will have, but because of the principle of it. But guys, that's what I think about their explanation. Let me know what you think in the comments down below. I look forward to seeing all of the clippies down there because they seem to really love this this subject. I'll see you on the next one. And until next time, stay nerdy, my friends. <laughs>